Section four of the Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rivals of Sherlock Holmes, Volume One. The Affair of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited, by Arthur Morrison, Part Two. The prospectus of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company stated that the works were at Exeter and Birmingham. Exeter is a delightful old town, but it can scarcely be regarded as the centre of the cycle trade. Neither is it in especially easy and short communication with Birmingham. It was the sort of thing that any critic anxious to pick holes in the prospectus might wonder at, and so one of Dorrington's assistants had gone by the night mail to inspect the works. It was from this man that Dorrington in Birmingham, about noon on the day after Gillett's disaster, received this telegram. Works here old disused cloth mills just out of town. Closed and empty, but with big new signboard, and notice that works now running are at Birmingham. Agent says only deposit paid. Tenancy agreement not signed. Farish. The telegram increased Dorrington's satisfaction, for he had just taken a look at the Birmingham works. They were not empty, though nearly so, nor were they large, and a man there had told him that the chief premises where most of the work was done were at Exeter, and the hollower the business the better prize he saw in store for himself. He had already, early in the morning, indulged in a telegram on his own account, though he had not signed it. This was how it ran. Mallows, 58 Upper Sandown Place, London, W. Fear all not safe here. Run down by 1010 train without fail. Thus it happened that at a little later than half past eight, Dorrington's other assistant, watching the door of number 58 Upper Sandown Place, saw a telegram delivered, and immediately afterward, Mr. Paul Mallows, in much haste, dashed away in a cab which was called from the end of the street. The assistant followed in another. Mr. Mallows dismissed his cab at a theatrical wig-maker's in Bow Street and entered. When he emerged in little more than forty minutes' time, none but a practised watcher, who had guessed the reason of his visit, would have recognised him. He had not assumed the clumsy disguise of a false beard. He was made up deftly. His colour was heightened, and his face seemed thinner. There was no heavy accession of false hair, but a slight crepe hair whisker at each side made a better and less pronounced disguise. He seemed a younger, healthier man. The watcher saw him safely off to Birmingham by the ten minutes past ten train, and then gave Dorrington note by telegraph of the guise in which Mr. Mallows was travelling. Now this train was timed to arrive at Birmingham at one, which was the reason that Dorrington had named it in the anonymous telegram. The entrance to the avalanche works was by a large gate, which was closed, but which was provided with a small door to pass a man. Within was a yard, and at a little before one o'clock Dorrington pushed open the small door, peeped, and entered. Nobody was about in the yard, and what little noise could be heard came from a particular part of the building on the right. A pile of solid export crates stood to the left, and these Dorrington had noticed at his previous cast that morning as making a suitable hiding place for temporary use. Now he slipped behind them and awaited the stroke of one. Prompt at the hour, a door on the opposite side of the yard swung open, and two more and a boy emerged and climbed one after another through the little door in the big gate. Then presently another man, not a workman, but apparently a sort of overseer, came from the opposite door, which he carelessly left fall to behind him, and he also disappeared through the little door, which he then locked. Dorrington was now alone in the sole active works of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited. He tried the door opposite and found it was free to open. Within he saw in a dark corner a candle which had been left burning, and opposite him a large iron enamelling oven, like an immense safe, 
and round about on benches were strewn heaps of the glaring red and gold transfer which Dorrington had observed the day before on the machines exhibited in the Holborn viaduct window. Some of the frames had the label newly applied, and others were still plain. It would seem that the chief business of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited was the attaching of labels to previously nondescript machines. But there was little time to examine further, and indeed Dorrington presently heard the noise of a key in the outer gate. So he stood and waited by the enamelling oven to welcome Mr. Mallows. As the door was pushed open, Dorrington advanced and bowed politely. Mallows started guiltily, but remembering his disguise, steadied himself, and asked gruffly, "'Well, sir, and who are you?' "'I,' answered Dorrington, with perfect composure, "'I am Mr. Paul Mallows. You may have heard of me in connection with the Indestructible Bicycle Company.' Mallows was altogether taken aback. But then it struck him that perhaps the detective, anxious to win the reward he had offered in the matter of the Gillette outrage, was here making inquiries in the assumed character of the man who stood impenetrably disguised before him. So, after a pause, he asked again, a little less gruffly, "'And what may be your business?' Uh, "'Well,' said Dorrington, "'I did think of taking shares in this company. "'I suppose there would be no objection "'to the managing director of another company "'taking shares in this.' "'No,' answered Mallows, "'wondering what all this was to lead to. "'Of course not. "'I'm sure you don't think so, eh?' "'Dorrington, as he spoke, "'looked in the other's face with a sly leer, "'and Mallows began to feel altogether uncomfortable. "'But there's one other thing. Dorrington pursued, taking out his pocket-book, though still maintaining his leer in Mallow's face. One other thing. And, by the way, will you have another piece of court plaster now I've got it out? Don't say no. It's a pleasure to oblige you, really. And Dorrington, his leer growing positively fiendish, tapped the side of his nose with the case of court plaster. Mallow's, paled under the paint, gasped and felt for support. Dorrington laughed pleasantly. <laughs> oh, come, come, he said encouragingly. Don't be frightened. I admire your cleverness, Mr. Mallows, and I shall arrange everything pleasantly, as you will see. And as to the court plaster, if you'd rather not have it, you needn't. You have another piece on now, I see. Why didn't you get them to paint it over at Clarkson's? They really did the face very well, though. And there again you were quite right. Such a man as yourself was likely to be recognized in such a place as Birmingham, and that would have been unfortunate for both of us. For both of us, I assure you. A man alive, don't look as though I was going to cut your throat. I'm not, I assure you. You're a smart man of business, and I happen to have spotted a little operation of yours, that's all. I shall arrange easy terms for you. Uh, pull yourself together and talk business before the men come back. Here, here, sit on this bench. Mallow, staring amazedly in Dorrington's face, suffered himself to be led to a bench and sat on it. Now, said Dorrington, the first thing is a little matter of a hundred pounds. That was the reward you promised if I should discover who broke Gillett's arm last night. Well, I have. Do you happen to have any notes with you? If not, may make it a check. But, but, but how? I mean, who? Who? Oh, t -t 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 don't waste time, Mr. Mallows. Who? <laughs> Why, yourself, of course. I knew all about it before I left you last night, though it wasn't quite convenient to claim the reward then, for reasons you'll understand presently. Come, that little uh, hundred. But uh, what, what proof have you? I'm not to be bounced like this, you know. Mr. Mallows was gathering his faculties again. Proof? <laughs> why, why, man alive, be reasonable. Suppose I have none, none at all. What difference does that make? <laughs> am I to walk out and tell your fellow directors where I have met you here, or am I to have that hundred? More, am I to publish abroad that Mr. Paul Mallows is the moving spirit in the rotten Avalanche Bicycle Company? Well, <laughs> Mallows answered reluctantly, if you 
put it like that but i i only put it like that to make you see things reasonably as a matter of fact your connection with this new company is enough to bring your little performance with the iron chair pretty near proof but i got at it from the other side see here you you're much too clumsy with your fingers mr mallows first you go and tear the tip of your middle finger opening your broom door and have to get court plaster from me then you let that court plaster get frayed at the edge and you still keep it on <laughs> after that you execute your very successful chair operation when the eyes of the others are following the bicycles you take the chair in the hand with the plaster on it catching hold of it at the place where a rough loose square nut protrudes and you pitch it on the track so clumsily and nervously that the nut carries away the frayed thread of the court plaster with it. Here it is, you see, still in my pocketbook, where I put it last night by the light of the lantern. Just a sticky black silk thread, that's all. I've only brought it to show you I'm playing a fair game with you. Of course, I might easily have got a witness before I took the thread off the nut, if I had thought you were likely to fight the matter. But I knew you were not. You can't fight, you know, with this bogus company business known to me. So that I am only showing you this thread is an act of grace, to prove that I have stumped you with perfect fairness. And now the hundred. Here's a fountain pen, if you want one. Well, said Mallows glumly, I suppose I must, then... He took the pen and wrote the check. Dorrington blotted it on the pad of his pocket-book and folded it away. "'So much for that,' he said. "'That's uh, just a little preliminary, you understand. We've done these things just as a guarantee of good faith, not necessarily for publication, though you must remember that as yet there's nothing to prevent it. I've done you a turn by finding out who upset those bicycles, as you so ardently wished me to do last night, and you've loyally fulfilled your part of the contract by paying me the promised reward. Though I must say that you, uh, you haven't paid with all the delight and pleasure you spoke of at the time. But I'll forgive you that, and, and now that the little hors d'oeuvre is uh, disposed of, we'll proceed to serious business." Mallow looked uncomfortably glum. "'But you mustn't look so ashamed of yourself, you know,' Dorrington said, purposely misinterpreting his glumness. "'It's all business. You were disposed for a little side-flutter, so to speak, a little speculation outside your regular business. Well, you mustn't be ashamed of that.' "'No,' Mallows observed, assuming something of his ordinarily ponderous manner. "'No, of course not. It's a little speculative deal. Everybody does it, and there's a deal of money going.' "'Precisely. And since everybody does it, and there is so much money going, you are only making your share.' "'Of course.' Mr. Mallows was almost pompous by now. <clears throat> "'Of course.' Dorrington coughed slightly. Uh, "'Well, now.' Do you know, I'm exactly the same sort of man as yourself, if you don't mind the comparison. I am disposed for a little side business, so to speak, a little speculation outside my regular business. I also am not ashamed of it. And since everybody does it, and there is so much money going, why, I am thinking of making my share, so that we are evidently a pair, and naturally intended for each other. Mr. Paul Mallows here looked a little doubtful. "'See here now,' Dorrington proceeded. "'I have lately taken it into my head to operate a little on the cycle-share market. Uh, that was why I came round myself about that little spoke affair, instead of sending an assistant. I wanted to know somebody who understood the cycle trade, from whom I might get tips. Uh, you see, I'm perfectly frank with you. Well, I have succeeded uncommonly well.' and I want you to understand that I have gone every step of the way by fair work. I took nothing for granted, and I played the game fairly. When you asked me, as you had anxious reason to ask, if I had found anything, I told you there was nothing very big. 
and see what a little thing the thread was. Before I came away from the pavilion, I made sure that you were really the only man there with black court plaster on his fingers. I had noticed the hands of every man but two, and I made all excuse of uh, borrowing something to see those. I saw your thin presence of suspecting the betting men, and I played up on it. I have had a telegraphic report on your Exeter works this morning, a deserted cloth mills with nothing on it of yours but a signboard, and only a deposit of rent paid. There they referred to the works here. Here they referred to the works there. It was very clever, really. Also, I have had a telegraphic report of your make-up adventure this morning. Clarkson does it marvelously, doesn't he? And, by the way, that telegram bringing you down to Birmingham was not from your confederate here, as perhaps you fancied. It was from me. Thanks for coming so promptly. I managed to get a quiet look round here just before you arrived, and, on the whole, the conclusion I come to as to the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited is this. A clever man, whom it gives me great pleasure to know, with a bow to Mallows, conceives the notion of offering the public the very rottenest cycle company ever planned, and all without appearing in it himself. He finds what little capital is required. Uh, his two or three confederates help to make up a board of directors, with one or two titled guinea pigs, who know nothing of the company and care nothing, and the rest's easy. A professional racing man is employed to win races and make records on machines which have been specially made by another firm. Uh, perhaps it was the indestructible, who knows, uh, to a private order, and afterwards decorated with the name and style of the bogus company on a transfer. For ordinary sale, bicycles of the trade description are bought, so much a hundred from the factors, and put your own name on them. They come cheap, and they sell at a good price. The profit pays all expenses and perhaps a bit over, and by the time they all break down, the company will be successfully floated. The money, the capital, will be divided. The moving spirit and his confederates will have disappeared, and the guinea pigs will be left to stand the racket, if there is a racket. And the moving spirit will remain unsuspected. A man of account in the trade all the time. Admirable. All the work to be done at the works is the sticking on of labels and a bit of enameling. Excellent all round. Isn't that about the size of your operations? Well, uh, yes, Mallows answered a little reluctantly, but with something of modest pride in his manner. That was the notion, since you speak so plainly. And it shall be the notion, all, everything, shall be as you have planned it, with one exception, which is this. The moving spirit shall divide his plunder with me. You? But, but why, I gave you a hundred just now. Oh, dear, dear. Why will you harp so much on that vulgar little hundred? That's settled and done with. That's our little personal bargain in the manner of the l lamentable accident with the chair. We are now talking of bigger business, not hundreds, but thousands, and not one of them, but a lot. Come now, a mind like yours should be wide enough to admit of a broad and large view of things. If I refrain from exposing this charming scheme of yours, I shall be promoting a piece of scandalous robbery. Very well, then. I want my promotion money in the regular way. Can I shut my eyes and allow a piece of iniquity like this to go on unchecked without getting anything by way of damages for myself? <laughs> Perish the thought. When all expenses are paid and the Confederates are sent off with as little as they will take, you and I will divide fairly. Mr. Mallow's respectable brothers in rascality. Mind, I might say, we'd divide to begin with and leave you to pay expenses. But I am always fair to a partner in anything of this sort. I shall just want a little guarantee, you know. It's safest in such matters as these. Say a bill at six months for uh, 
ten thousand pounds, which is very low. When a satisfactory division is made, you shall have the bill back. Come, I have a bill stamp ready, being so much convinced of your reasonableness as to buy it this morning, though it cost five pounds. But that's, that's, that's nonsense. You're trying to impose. I'll give you anything reasonable. Half is out of the question. What, after all the trouble and worry and risk that I've had? Which would suffice for no more than to put you in jail if I held up my finger. But hang it, be reasonable. You're a mighty clever man, and you've got me on the hip, as I admit. Say, ten uh, percent. You're wasting your time, and presently the men will be back. Your choice is between making half or making none and going to jail into the bargain. Choose. But. "'Just consider. Choose!' Mallows looked despairingly about him. "'But really,' he said, "'I want the money more than you think. I—' "'For the last time, choose!' Mallows' despairing gaze stopped at the enamelling of it. "'Well, well,' he said, "'if I must, I must, I suppose. "'But I warn you, you may regret it. Oh, oh, dear, no, I'm not so pessimistic. Come, you wrote a check, now I'll write the bill. Six months after date, pay to me or my order the sum of ten thousand pounds for value received. Excellent value, too, I think. There you are. When the bill was written and signed, Mallow scribbled his acceptance with more readiness than might have been expected. Then he rose and said with something of a brisk cheerfulness in his tone, well, uh, that's done. And the least said, the soonest mended. You've won it, and I won't grumble any more. I think I've done this thing pretty neatly, eh? Come and see the works. Every other part of the place was empty of machinery. There were a good many finished frames and wheels, bought separately, and now in course of being fitted together for sale, and there were many more complete bicycles of cheap but showy make, to which nothing needed to be done but to fix the red and gold transfer of the avalanche company. Then Mallows opened the tall iron door of the enamelling oven. See this, he said. This is the enamelling oven. Get in and look round. The frames and other different parts hang on the racks after the enamel is laid on, and all those gas jets are lighted to harden it by heat. Do you, uh, do you see that deeper part there uh, by the back? Uh, go closer. Dorrington felt a push at his back, and the door was swung to with a bang, and the latch dropped. He was in the dark, trapped in a great iron chamber, and instantly Dorrington's nostrils were filled with the smell of escaping gas. He realized his peril on the instant. Mallows had given him the bill with the idea of silencing him by murder and recovering it. He had pushed him into the oven and had turned on the gas. It was dark, but to light a match would mean death instantly, and without the match it must be death by suffocation and poison of gas in a very few minutes. To appeal to Mallow was useless, Dorrington knew too much. It would seem that at last a horribly fitting retribution had overtaken Dorrington in death by a mode parallel to that which he and his creatures had prepared for others. Dorrington's victims had drowned in water, or at least Crofton's had, for I never ascertained definitely whether anybody had met his death by the tank after the Croftons had taken service with Dorrington, and now Dorrington himself was to drown in gas. The oven was of sheet iron, fastened by a latch in the center. Dorrington flung himself desperately against the door, and it gave outwardly at the extreme bottom. He snatched a loose angle iron with which his hand came in contact, dashed against the door once more, and thrust the iron through where it strained open. Then, with another tremendous plunge, he drove the door a little more outward and raised the angle iron in the crack, then once more, and raised it again. He was near to losing his senses, when, with one more plunge, the catch of the latch not designed for such treatment suddenly gave way, the door flew open, and Dorrington blew in the face, staring, stumbling, and gasping, came staggering out into the fresh air, followed by a gush of gas. 
Mallows had retreated to the rooms behind, and thither Dorrington followed him, gaining vigour and fury at every step. At sight of him the wretched Mallows sank in a corner, sighing and shivering with terror. Dorrington hauled the struggling wretch across the room, tearing off the crepe whiskers as he came, while Mallows supplicated and whined, fearing that it might be the other's design to imprison him in the enamelling oven. But at the door of the room against that containing the oven their progress came to an end, for the escaped gas had reached the lighted candle, and with one loud report the partition wall fell in, half burying Mallows where he lay and knocking Dorrington over. Windows fell out of the building, and men broke through the front gate, climbed into the ruined rooms, and stopped the still escaping gas. When the two men and the boy returned with the conspirator who had been in charge of the works, they found a crowd from the hardware and cycle factories thereabout, surveying with great interest the spectacle of the extrication of Mr. Paul Mallows, managing director of the indestructible bicycle company, from the broken bricks, mortar, bicycles, and transfers of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited, and the preparations for carrying him to a surgeon's, where his broken leg might be set. And in a couple of hours it was all over Birmingham, and spreading to other places, that the business of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company consisted of sticking brilliant labels on factors' bicycles, bought in batches. So that when, next day, Lant won the fifty miles race in London, he was greeted with ironical shouts of, "'Come on, you traps, sir!' Oh, I mind your label. Where'd you steal the bicycle? Sold your shares, and so forth. Somehow the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited never went to allotment. It was found politic also that Mr. Paul Mallows should retire from the directorate of the indestructible bicycle company. As for Dorrington, he had his hundred pounds reward but the bill for ten thousand pounds he never presented. Why, I do not altogether know, unless he found that Mr. Mallow's financial position, as he had hinted, was not altogether so good as was supposed. End of the Affair of the Avalanche Bicycle and Tire Company Limited by Arthur Morrison Part 2